Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffin Door, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 6, The Journey from Platform 9 and 3 Quarters. Oh boy! How you doing, Ben? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm very excited. Um, I think this is a really, it's a really fun chapter. Um, I think there's like some some interesting like little uh, bits of connective tissue that I think hold up pretty well. I think that there are some like little. Um, clearly, this was the first books, and certain there things had a, not I, been established. Yes, there was a bunch of times where I was like, "This sentence didn't age well," yeah, or "This doesn't yeah. make sense." Like, like, I understand what you're trying to say about this character, but also it just it doesn't make sense. Um, I will say I was check I was checking the charts, you know, as I do before we started. I will say that um, I found this one pretty interesting, not to brag or anything, but we are presently number one on the books chart in Sweden. What? Yeah. Shout yeah. out to Sweden. What up, Sweden? <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we're in like the the top ten of the books chart of like almost every country, but Sweden top spot. How about that? How about that? I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder how or why for the longest time, I feel like on the super Carlin brothers channel, we were making a, a reasonable amount of frozen uh, related content. Mm. And I, I was always like, is, is that's like, you know, Scandinavian Norway. I was like, is, is this possibly how or why this particular area of the world is tuned in? But maybe they're just big Potter fanatics. Maybe that's, maybe that's what it is. That could, that's always one of those are like, do people from that region love frozen? Or are they like, Oh, frozen. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's a, it's always a good question because like, you know, whenever you're depicted in some capacity, we've, we frequently said this about the, like the Percy Jackson books, how oftentimes like a lot of the very like American references end up feeling like they fall flat more than they feel like whimsical. Yeah. And, and, but like, I could totally see it being the case if you're from a different country and none of these things mean anything like in such a um, immediate regard, it's like, well, that's pretty cool. Um, and actually fun fact about this chapter in particular, cause I did find, um, I found a small chapter change based on which language that you read uh, the, the chapter in. Oh, yeah. And Trevor the Toad in, in anybody from a Spanish speaking you know country or who has read the Spanish speaking version uh, or Spanish written version rather, um, uh, let me know. But apparently Trevor the Toad is uh, Trevor the Tortuga. The Tortuga. Uh, which is actually a turtle. Ah. <laughs> so oh, that makes so much sense, though, doesn't it? Like, I, I think, God, this is just this is just connecting some dots in my brain. I want to say, like, isn't it in, like, Aladdin and the King of Thieves, Thieves are looking for, like, the Isle of Tortuga or something? Oh, you could be correct. I think that's what it's called. And, of course, it's just an island at the back of a floating turtle. You're right. Yeah. You're right. So maybe, but but I, literally, I was going off the the uh, Trevor no. and Tortuga, or is Tortuga the 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 village in Pirates of the Caribbean? It could be both. Could be both. Okay. Anyway, we're not even talking about Harry Potter at the moment. I know. Yeah, we've we've gone off we've gone off the <laughs> proverbial is, rails. Well, if you listened to popcorn culture, that would have been the whole episode. We'd have continued down that line of thought for one hour. <laughs> but instead, we will start with uh, the the journey from platform nine and three quarters. Yes. Uh, the chapter does begin uh, once again, where there's. Um, uh, Harry is back at the Dursleys for a full month. For a um, full month. And honestly, Ooh. all I can say is pretty much fortunately, we spend no more than um, about a page and a half back at the Dursleys before we successfully make it. Thankfully. Um, I yes. mean, and in that, I mean, they managed to be pretty awful inside of that like one page wherein Harry asks them, can you give me a ride to King's Cross, which they begrudgingly agree to because they just happen to already be going to London. Um, but it is so clear right away that part of the reason they agree to it is because Harry tells them the platform number, which is nine and three quarters. And they're like, ha, there's no such platform, boy. And then they get there and they're like, ha, I told you, bye. And they're like, like their plan, their plan right here is to abandon him. It, like, that's what they do. As it, far as they're concerned, they left him in a no-win situation forever. It just speaks to how mean the Dursleys are, too. Because, like, what, what Harry's literally doing is using his own resources, optionally choosing to spend all but eight weeks in their, in their home, 
and and will just be gone. He won't. Yeah. He will not be in any way, shape, or form like like a like an ongoing you know burden in the eyes of the of the Dursleys anymore. It's like right. like I can't understand why they're not like celebrating. Yeah, you know, like it, it feels more like like a more likely version of this would almost seem like they would go and be like, well, now we're going off to the islands of. Majorca, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't know to to go in to go in holiday for a little bit to celebrate you know the departure of one uh, Harry James Potter, but instead uh, instead yeah the, it's just such a such a strange approach. But um, that being said, I think that there are a couple of really interesting things. We know how the Dursleys feel about the magical world, but there is like um, a couple of little things that sort of stood out to me a little bit about as Harry is sort of like almost changing perspectives and going from the you know existing in the Muggle world and go- crossing over into the wizarding world where now the wizarding world I feel like almost has like its own bias facing backwards at the muggle world and one of those things is like when they drop him off at the train station like they specifically refer to the signs for platform 9 and platform 10 as plastic signs yeah. which like there's something about the the like choice of word like the choice of plastic like instead of saying like the placard that read platform nine versus the placard that read platform 10 like like the plasticness just feels so flimsy it It feels feels so muggle so muggle (laughs) so like so very non-magical whereas i feel like like you know uh in in once you're in the wizarding world everything is like you know like like um like iron, you know, or like the, the or wooden stone or stone. Yeah. 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 Like everything feels so much more like substantial and right. like meaningful not and plastic and not plastic. Yeah. Also, um, there's like a, a bit of a weird inconsistency just between this book and the other book and, and uh, the other books moving forward, neither of which I think is accurate to the actual um, uh, location of King's cross, wherein it looks, it says in this book that they, um, Basically, have a good term, said Uncle Vernon with an even nastier smile. He left it out of the word. He returned and saw the Dursleys drive away. Okay, so this that suggests that from their car, they are parking between platforms 9 and 10 and just like saying, here, look, there's nothing there. See ya. Like, they're still in their car having the conversation, which is like, one, that is certainly not where you would arrive to like you can't park between platforms nine and ten in a car like you have to you have to like walk into a building to get to where the platforms are at all you couldn't be sitting next to the spots in a car right which is just funny because then in the next book they're going to go out to the parking lot to get into the car to fly it to the school and there's also no parking lot. So there's just funny that on two occasions, the way in which cars interact with this building are inaccurate. <laughs> it, it does feel surprising just because it's like King's Cross clearly like goes on to be a really, really significant location as does Platform 9 and 3 quarters, which we can get to in a minute as well because there's I have something to say about that. Yeah. But like, you know, I, I eventually, I mean, if you fast forward literally to like the very end of the saga, like, you know, when Harry goes and faces death in the forest where he ends up going to is King's Cross Station. It's, yeah. it's sort of like this this place where Harry sort of like leaves the um you know the muggle world behind and, and really enters the magical world like like you know in a much more proper way. Like he's of course gone to Diagon Alley already, but like the the significance of this location in particular is is rather prominent and like the selection of this location had to have been like pretty specific, you know, for, mm-hmm. for a certain amount of reasons. I mean, I guess there's the the um you know uh cross metaphor oh yeah know, symbolism like there is the a very that- biblical allegory happening wherein harry dies and ends up in king's cross before he comes back to life yeah it's yeah. like yeah that's okay that's a it's so very on the nose yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it truly is though <laughs> yeah um but either way yeah so harry harry wakes up early um and, and i do love like you know for him there's a couple of these like little moments but just like his excitement um you know waking up early i mean it does remind me a lot of like waking up early for for like christmas or something something like that, you know, like where it's just like you like normally waking up early in the morning as like a young kid is never, ever, ever, ever the preferred scenario. So I I love the excitement (laughs) for him that he's just like anxiously awaiting his ability to, um, you know, to to head off to school. Um, He does uh, successfully make it to King's Cross Station where the Dursleys, as we said, leave him, uh, assuming that he is probably just going to be like stranded at this point in time. Um, Although, to be fair, Harry did just strand them uh, boatless on, you know, 
in the, true. in the hut on the rock, yeah. you know, in the very last chapter. So I guess oh, they got back within a day, though. You know, they seem to make it. They seem to make Everything it. Everything seems to be okay. Yep. I do like that when they leave him. It says according to the large clock over the arrivals board, he had ten minutes left to get on the train. And I like to think that that's more of like a rounding thing, and that it was closer to like nine and three quarter minutes left. Hey, you know? I love it. That was so good. That was so good. Speaking of nine and three quarters, though, uh, Harry doesn't know what to do because he doesn't know where nine and three quarters is. Uh, enter the Weasley family. The Weasley. Uh, where there is no Arthur for some reason. Yeah, I don't you know. know he's, he's not there. He's not there to drop the kids off, which, yeah, you know, maybe I, just working that I'm day. I was having so much fun with this chapter. So, packed with muggles, of course. That is the very first line from any Weasley we hear in the story. Oh, that's a fun fact. Yeah, so, like, so, yeah, who is the first Weasley we ever hear speak is right, Molly. Is Molly. And then yeah. I think it's also fun. I think you hear Ginny talk next before you talk to any of the other ones. Yes. It's, Mom, can't I go? Which is so funny. And then what I think is so funny is that Ginny's the first one to talk, and it's like, I just highlight that line too and it's like no, they're gonna get married <laughs> <laughs> that's harry seeing his wife for the first time that's so fun i know i know yeah no it's, it's really wild um there's of course uh molly asking uh the family now what's the platform number and this is like this is one of those things mm-hmm. where it's like like even in the uh i think in the film um haggard says like now what's your like what's your platform number stick to your number that's very important um and it's like one of those things where like it must have just not been decided yet, like whether or not these quirky, like would they rotate, you know, like getting like next year, could it be like seven and one eighths? Right. Or like, like would it always be ever so slightly different? But I feel like this was like one of those things where, where maybe it wasn't known how iconic platform nine and three quarters would be. And then it was like, well, now that we've established it, we can't, we can't it can't be. That's anything almost else. exactly what it had to be because yeah, now what's the platform number? I literally highlighted that and then wrote the word nope next to it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's just like, yeah. nope, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In your world, this is an incredibly iconic location to everyone, and the number is very obvious. You do not need to check. You know, like it, like there's no way Molly Weasley doesn't know that you board the Hogwarts Express at platform nine and three quarters, especially since this isn't like her first year. Like she's not like, oh yeah, I graduated a long time ago and this is my first kid. It's like, no, 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 no. In this chapter, we learned that you've got seven kids. Yeah, so two, two fully graduated. Yeah, you so know, um, you've been here every single year for at least the last what nine ten years right <laughs> yeah but then can i say uh, on the flip end of the spectrum is i feel like the introduction to fred and george is so perfect like their characters i feel like we're just locked in from the very beginning oh, absolutely so we we get like the exchange and, and it's like it, it's always been one of my favorites but uh molly basically says fred you next and uh Let's see here. Fred says, I'm not Fred. I'm George, said the boy. Honestly, woman, you call yourself our mother. Can't you tell I'm George? Sorry, George, dear. Only joking. I am Fred. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's the, it's the first thing you know about them. Right. It's just like, it's like, like everything else that follows just fits that exchange perfectly. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, that's like a fun piece of like continuity that will just like continue on forever. And then actually there's even an additional piece of continuity that I don't know that I've ever picked up on before, uh, which is that, um, shortly thereafter, as like the the train is leaving, I'm just jumping ahead a little bit right now. But Fred and George tell Ginny that they will mail her a toilet seat, yes, and uh, like a Hogwarts toilet seat or whatever, as like a joke. And this is always one of those like trivia facts that I feel like gets lost in my brain sometimes because I'm like, I swear I thought Fred and George tried to send Harry a toilet seat at the end of this book um, when he's in the hospital wing after his, you know, eventual battle oh. with Pearl <laughs> and Voldemort. And I went to the, like, I went to like one of the last pages and sure enough, they did attempt to send him a toilet seat. Oh. <laughs> so they are like their relationship with this whole toilet seat thing, uh, which is prompted to them by their mother, by their mom. Yeah. yeah who's who I think specifically says like, now behave yourself this year. Like don't go blowing up any toilets. We've never blown up any toilets. Well, that's a great idea, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Dude, like, they, yeah, they right. really, they, no, I was going to say, so they just, um, I, I feel like Fred and George from the very beginning are exactly Fred and George, and I love that there's, like, this this hilarious, like, throwback to the toilet seat joke. Oh, yeah, right Towards, away. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, that's um, super fun. I also noticed something as I was reading through this chapter that I had never noticed the first time, and maybe it's just because last week we made two videos basically pointing out, like, how brave Harry is the whole yes. time. yep. But, like, there are, I think, like, four occasions in this chapter alone where Harry like 
is described as brave or whatever, or has to do something. Like I kept underlining, I was like, he's brave again. He's brave again. He's brave again. I'm like, wow, they're really hammering, which makes sense because this is the chapter right before he's going to get sorted into Gryffindor. Yes. And that's like the thing. So maybe th- maybe it's like, oh yeah, really establish Harry's bravery here, like uh, on the train ride. But like um, as he's, as Molly is describing how to get onto the platform, she says, don't stop and don't be scared. You'll crash into it. That's very important. I literally highlighted, don't be scared. And was like, <laughs> as if. Um, so th- that's the first thing he has to do right there. And then I think it keeps coming up as well. I'll, well, I'll bring it up as we keep going on because I kept highlighting it. But I thought that was funny. Then he gets on the platform. And this was what I thought was uh, a weird thing. It said, cats of every color wound here and there between their legs. And I was like, I guess we're just trying to paint a scene for like, oh, isn't it so magical? Look at all these animals just everywhere. But like, why Why are the cats just roaming around? It, uh, yeah, it, it's <laughs> like they would almost certainly, just like, like the owls, probably be in some type of like transportation container. Right. Yeah. Um, like I, well, you know, I, why? Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. So it, it does seem kind of unlikely. Not to mention, it seems like when uh, Hermione eventually has Crookshanks, it's not like it's not like it needs to say like Crookshanks was was playing with another you know cat in the corner of the Gryffindor common room it's like I don't it doesn't seem like cats ever come up other than Crookshanks ever I know it seemed like oh and Mrs. Norris yeah yeah with this many cats around yeah like you never hear about other other students having cats even though some other Gryffindors must just have animals oh absolutely right yep yep speaking of which um we also get Neville's first line ever which is Gran I've lost my toad again (laughs) Yes, I know. And I, this was the thing. Like, I literally, I, I, I was kind of like mind blown how much you get beaten over the head. Like, it, it, it's almost like to the point where I'm like, like, is, is this like verging on like a little bit like redundant or possibly even like unnecessary? Because I think Neville, like the, the like disruptions or the number of like interjections that come from Neville losing his toad, I think is like four It is times. like four. It's like, yeah, that's the very first thing he ever says. And then... I get it's. I mean, even then, it says I've lost my toad again. So it's like clear this has happened before. But now he's boarding the train. He yeah. must find Trevor on the train and then lose him again because then he's traveling the corridors. Yeah, and he's asking, and then eventually Hermione interjects, saying yeah. that Neville has lost a toad. And then uh, by the time they board the boats to go to Hogwarts, Hagrid asks, like, Neville, did you find your toad? And it's he like, just says, is that your toad? Oh, yeah. Okay. And it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That to me, it, the way he says it, it's almost like, did Neville not even realize Trevor was in the boat? I, I, you know? I, I know. Yeah. It's like, I, I can't imagine how Trevor ends up being a character in any capacity at all. Like, it would have been fine even if they just had Trevor jump off the boat and go, like, live in the, the Black Lake from the very beginning. And it was just sort of like, yeah, this this kid is not intended to, to have... Uh, the boat, but or not the boat, the, the toad. Um, so like, I, but I ended up doing like a little bit of reading on this because this has always been one of those things where I'm kind of like, like clearly what you're trying to establish with Neville is that like, he's kind of got this like forgetfulness or like yeah. maybe like he's not always paying attention. So like the, the remember all that's coming will eventually make sense. But like um, one of the things that I saw sprout up is that apparently like when the book first came out or, or maybe like a few books in when we eventually learn about Neville's uncle Algy, yeah. who is the one who uh, I believe originally gifted Neville the no, uh, the the toad uh like that there was some possibility that trevor is actually uncle algae as an animagus and he's like tr- constantly trying to like escape <laughs> why like, well i have no idea yeah. and it's like it doesn't really hold up very well <coughs> at all because it's like if you're an animagus it's like you could just get away extremely easily uh or well, maybe you'd think except boy does peter have a time escaping crookshanks well in a that's, couple years that's true that's true maybe um, okay n- new theory new theory maybe because you never learn anything specifically magical about trevor at all like he keeps being lost, and that's sort of his one trick gag the whole time. Yeah. Just that he's he's trying to get away from Neville. May what if his power is that something about him produces like like some sort of like memory loss toxin? Oh, that would be extremely you know? interesting. Yeah, like, I like that. It's not that yep. I'm, it's not that Neville's like losing him or that he's trying to escape. It's just that he keeps forgetting about him at all because of him. Well, and there's a couple of big things that we can talk about here, uh, not the least of which is the fact that both Ron and Neville have one arm tied behind their back going to school and that they're both using hand-me-down wands. Um, yes. We know that Neville is going to be using his father's old wand um, and that Ron is using his uh, brother Charlie's, Charlie's wand, wand, which I had a cool theory 
theory on oh. um, because it was like, this is like one of those big questions where it's like wands are not a pass downable thing. Like your relationship with your wand only grows the longer that you have it. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, Charlie goes on to work with dragons and we know that this wand has unicorn hair sticking out. And I was like, what if Charlie found his affinity for dragons, went to work with dragons, made his own wand using dragon heartstring? That honestly sounds pretty good because I don't know why you would pass a wand down at all. That, that's what I was saying. Yeah. yeah like it's it's just like not why? really like it's it's not like a known there's not really a basis for it. Like there, your relationship with your wand, the fact that the wand chooses the wizard is so specific yeah. that like, it, it's kind of like one of those things. And then if you go into the, the deeper reading about like Ron's wand in particular, the, the particular pairing of core and wood, um, if you read about it, it will actually specifically say like, these are notoriously like faithful wands to their original masters, but will not work well in the hands of somebody else. So yeah. like all of, um, Ron's struggle with with like mastering early magic for his first couple of years can largely be chalked up to the fact that he literally has a wand that actively does not want to listen to him. Yeah, we made like a whole video about this, but yeah, so the, the wand would, in combination with the unicorn hair, is the worst possible combination to have been passed down. Exactly. So, but but I think what you could also point to, to go back to your original point about uh, Trevor, is that we never learn any like magical abilities. We know that a lot of creatures that, that students can bring to school for some reason have magical something. Yeah. Um, you know, Crookshanks even being half Neasel is an incredibly clever cat and is able to like reveal a lot of plot related things in Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, so I like your thinking because it also suggests, because I think after maybe he, year three as well. We don't see Trevor anymore. I can't yeah. remember when, when he stops. Finally goes away. <laughs> yeah, he just sort of like disappears. But we know that like Neville is being hampered um, in a lot of ways, like, you know, uh, magically by some of the... Um, like generational like pressure that his grandmother is placing upon him, the the shadow that he's living in in the wake of his parents who were both brilliant wizards, um, the the trauma associated with what happens to them. Um, but we also know that Neville himself ends up being quite the talented wizard. So it's like it would make more sense if like what's literally happening is like Trevor has a particular ability that is not useful for its master, and he's also using a wand that is actively like you know, lessening his ability to excel. And so it's like, it's like ne Neville's a great wizard. He just has bad, like, like aura yeah. around him. Right. Yeah. He's been like poorly equipped to go to school. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but he, interestingly, uh, someone who is equipped with something kind of fascinating to me, uh, is Lee Jordan. Uh, I know who ends up being like, like another one of those characters who I absolutely love, you know, obviously Lee will do the commentary for, yeah, the, for uh, the Quidditch for, matches for Quidditches. and he's got like, it was, it was like sad to me, like reading through when Lee Jordan had graduated out and like, wasn't him anymore. Yeah. We eventually get Luna, which is like well worth the wait, which is but, well like, worth it. And Lee does go on to do Potter watch, which is also great. That's cool. So yeah, yeah you like a good, like a good throwback. Um, um, so he just had that that like, commentator, yeah. you know, like like uh, I'm like, a host, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had it in him, but the the thing that he's bringing with him to school, it, he has a box with something inside that poked out a long hairy leg, which we eventually learn to be uh, like a giant tarantula. They describe it as a giant tarantula, but I I like wrote next to it like acromantula because like we are exposed to, you know, uh, Aragog the. The, the giant spider in the forest. Who was believed to be the monster associated with the Chamber of Secrets. Right, and he's, of course, just a, a, basically a giant tarantula. Yes. As far as I can tell. And they are later classified as acromantula. So, like, when they later say that, like, Lee's got a giant tarantula, I'm like, is this a different breed of large spiders, or is it just, like the the words you're using to describe what it looks like uh, regardless it yeah. doesn't fall into the category of cat owl or toad yeah. which you're supposed to be authorized on but apparently i mean ron's bringing the you know scabbers the, the rat which doesn't end up being flagged in any way shape or form so maybe yeah. maybe it's more of a guideline than a rule you more know? the guidelines and actual rules yeah oh boy yeah so we meet peter let's see um speaking of oh i love when the twins meet harry for the first time which yep. george is the first to talk to him george is the first that's yep. always trivia or but, at least first weasley child to talk to him because obviously Molly already did. Um, but I love when they say, <laughs> they ask him like, Harry Potter, of course, the twins. And Harry goes, oh, him. 
I mean, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, love the, I just love the oh him like oh uh, yeah oh um, oh that guy that guy uh, yeah. yeah it's me it's, he, I'm he him. clearly Harry has not grown into his reputation in any way shape or form nope um, and it, honestly I feel like if you were the Weasleys you'd probably be like a little bit skeptical if if Harry himself responded oh him I mean no yeah that's me <laughs> yeah I know like mm, oh no are, yes it's like are you sure it's you <laughs> yeah uh, shortly after that we get Ron's first words in the story. Uh, which are mom, girl off, <laughs> girl off, <laughs> because he's got something on his nose. Like this is another one of those where I wish I could come up with some clever explanation, but like they, they even carried it over to the movies. But like, like it, I don't know if it's supposed to be like how Molly is maybe just like treating Ron as like the like if he's supposed to come across as like a little bit of like the underdog or the runt of the family or something like you know um, being like the youngest of the brothers. And then, like, because Ginny is like the daughter, like, yeah, like she gets special treatment, but like, it could, he couldn't have been bothered to like r- wash Ron's face. It, it, yeah. I, I don't even know what, yeah, yeah but like, it, it's so funny because it's like literally what you first see is that um, Molly is trying to wipe off Ron's nose, which is just embarrassing for Ron. But then, like, I think Harry notices that like there's still something on his nose. And then <laughs> he Hermione, do it. Uh, like, at the end, <laughs> is like, you have dirt on your nose. Did you know? Yeah. And it's like, I'm like, what is the deal with like is there supposed to like is this a reference or like like some kind of you know like i don't know um so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that is but they they certainly like really really hammer it down uh we also meet uh percy and here's another like one of those little changes that i think is kind of funny because the uh the audiobook has a difference uh in description of the prefix badge um which by the way i have to mention this for the first Five, six years that we read, five years at least that we read these books, we always read it as the perfects. Well, because this was this is uh, one where our our dad would read the books to us. Yes. And yes. he was reading it and saying the word perfect out loud instead of prefect. Yes. And like this is one that he eventually just like like in, in his brain, you know, he like a prefects, I think, are like um are like a real thing in like British boarding schools. Yeah, I, like, yeah, I think that's like a real position. Yeah, it's not right. just like a Hogwarts thing. So if you're American and you didn't have prefix at your school, like this is a real thing uh, across the pond, as it were. But like, I don't, I don't think our dad knew that either. And he was just seeing it, and like to him, he was just like, I think it just all blended together. And he said perfect, and and it was like, and it made sense. It's like one of those things where it's like, yeah, person the perfect. Yeah, it's like, oh, they have perfects at the school. The kids who are like the who follow the rules perfectly. Like, it, it made sense to me. It, it never, <laughs> yeah, never caused any fuss whatsoever. But so yeah, we, all, I'm, I'm sure that we're not alone on that. Um, at least maybe on the on the American side of things. But yeah, um, oh, I'll he, also point out on this exact same note that um, this is, since this is the chapter where we meet Hermione, we also called Hermione Hermoyne for like her for like, I don't know until the ever, movie until out. the movies. Yeah, yeah. We, we had no idea how to pronounce, <laughs> how to pronounce it. Yeah. Um, so but that I, was a huge one. <laughs> that was that was like one of those things again where where uh, I think I've watched an episode or a season of Great British Bake Off where there is somebody who is named Hermione yeah. as one of the contestants. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. OK, like that's so cool to see like another person, you know, bear this name. Um, anyway, long story long, um, the the um, shiny red and gold badge as written in the book that I'm holding is read in the audiobook as a. Um, um, shiny silver badge and apparently oh. this change was made because uh in order of the phoenix when ron eventually gets his badge it is described as being like um like a p with like the gryffindor like emblem on it oh, and okay. so it's it's meant to sort of like retroactively match the what, house. what they would look like in the future yep the house specifically okay. so anyway silver badge is how jim dale will read it red and gold badge is how it is uh written in the book what i find interesting about this is that occasionally when we're doing trivia uh for on the super carlin mother's channel like javer spence type stuff there will be like like oh my gosh i swear i remembered it as as this instead of that and occasionally we'll be like let's go to the book let's see what yeah. it says and like a lot of times you'll fact check it and you're like well it is right there, there so it anyway is. i feel like i had to make like a point out of that because it's like okay what color is the prefix badge and it's like red and gold and it's like silver it's silver like, it's like no no there's uh, been a change i know yeah that there's would be a little altercation yep exactly so anyway so the the prefix badge um we get a little bit more fred and george uh action with <laughs> <I> <laughs> it's like hang on i think i remember him saying something about it said the other twin once or twice a minute all summer <laughs> <laughs> they're just like so in sync and it's like your first interactions with them are all the same it's just like they are just they're just on all the time yep yep the other yeah. thing to kind of keep an eye out for and this was something that um 
uh, a patron of ours once pointed out to me, but it was uh, it was the fact that uh, Fred seems to be the like, and I'm going to put this in extreme air quotes because I don't know like amongst twins if this is like a thing or not. You have twin I, boys. I do have twin um, boys myself, Nick and Nate. <laughs> yes, it, it seems as though Fred is very consistently like the twin who will uh, like start uh, like interactions like right like he's 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 like very frequently like the lead the lead man of of like the twin duo but they're always 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 in sync like this so yeah not that it really matters but it was like one of those things i never picked up on before and then i've caught it yeah as like I'm once like you notice although it is george who talks to harry first and like summons fred over to help him that's true yeah that's true so yep. there's that um yep so then we get the we get the little line about the blowing up a toilet again yep. from the twins fantastic then um i love when they're talking to well this was interesting i thought they they're talking to molly again and said they saw they saw harry potter and he said saw a scar it's really there like lightning and i'm like it's interesting that word is out about the shape of harry's scar because oh, true yeah. because Why would it be well I, that's what i wrote in the next i was like either double Dumbledore or McGonagall or Hagrid has to have spilled the tea because they're the only ones who should have seen it. It's Hagrid. It's ha- oh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Shouldn't have told you that. Like, it's a thousand percent Hagrid. He's like, oh yeah, I delivered Harry. I just bolt a lightning on his head. He's a heck of a storyteller. Heck of a story. With, you with know, Tom down there at the Leaky Cauldron. I know. I actually, you you jumped one line ahead, and I was I thought you were going to talk about the exact same thing I highlighted, but um, there, there's just a cool little throwback line um, where like Molly points out like like you've already seen him Ginny and the poor boy isn't something you goggle at in the zoo um, I think this is sort of like good awareness on the part of Molly to sort of be like like you have already seen this person like just because now you know who he is like like doesn't it shouldn't change things just like with, with your perspective know, she's like hold my butter beer mom I'm gonna marry that kid okay shut up I know I know there's that <laughs> but it, it also it feels like the boa constrictor it like does, you yeah. know sort of like like Harry sort of relates the boa constrictor who's who's basically being goggled at at the zoo yeah um and so I think that that's like just immediately you can tell like like Molly Weasley is just good people so. yeah absolutely there is a line a little bit later on where uh just in this exact exchange where Fred says all right keep your hair on to a his mom and it was like i assume he's just joking but is it possible molly weasley is wearing a wig who knows the whole time I, <laughs> not that it matters but it was like what a hmm i'm, I'm sure it's just a joke um but. let's see here you, I, I mean i guess interestingly like if you go back to the original introduction it does say uh harry swung around the speaker was a plump woman who was talking to four boys all with flaming red hair each of them was pushing a trunk like harry's in front of him um and so it's like it just refers to the boys as, as having like the flaming red hair. So maybe, maybe, mm-hmm. to, maybe to who, knows? I don't know. who knows? Yeah. Maybe she's just wearing a wig matching the rest of the family. There you go. Yep. Um, so let's see. Then as we move forward, um, we do get the official reference to the giant tarantula, um, yep. you know, so that they, we do know that it is a, a spider that is specifically gi- giantified, um, made up, made up word. I just created just a gigantified. Now. Yeah. A gigantified. Oh, that's much better. I said giantified. Giantified. Yeah. 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 <laughs> My, mine was worse I'll, I'll admit it all right cool <laughs> yes i nailed one um no that i highlighted the line the door of the compartment slid open and the youngest red-headed boy came in chills i know i was like oh, it begins it begins like the best friendship like so many things don't happen if this doesn't happen like, i know like, this is such a big moment it is and and ron is like he's such a uh, a fantastic inclusion you know like i'm not inclusion he's obviously one of the like, most iconic and key characters of the entire story but like it's so great because i feel like the the like they harry and ron both have like their individual like strengths in terms of like especially with this very first encounter like they're both nervous for their own reasons and like harry sort of has this like notoriety but he like doesn't really understand it and then like ron's struggling with like feeling like he's sort of like the odd man out in the family where like the rest of the family's already done everything and so like you know even though um ron does have a better idea of like what's going on in the wizarding world like he has his own insecurities and so like i love the way that their friendship is like coming from from like it like some of the same things but for different reasons yeah Um, well i also like i i just made note of this because i think um like ron comes to the compartment and like slides it open but like at this point because of the exchange that just had with fred and george like he knows who harry is like he's not just like accidenting into the situation like he knows where harry is but i i to me it's like ron hearing his mom say like you've already seen him he's not some boy to be goggled at in the zoo like oh he must be so alone or whatever like it really sounds like ron like hears that and like seeks harry out oh like he's like looking to be like like hey like you know you're you're probably alone right now i can i can 
fix that. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's so sweet. I know. Ugh. He teared up. Ugh. It's a very emotional sentence. It is a very emotional sentence. I mean, like their their uh their their friendship is is remarkable and amazing and like it's it's at the heart of like what makes Harry Harry. I mean, it's like some of the most it's some of the most vital to the themes of the overall story. So yeah. um it, it's just amazing to get like that first entry point to to what that friendship will obviously ultimately uh kind of blossom into. Um, as, as we get like some of the exchanges with, with Ron and Harry, you get a little bit more, I mentioned before, like the thing about like the plastic, um, there's, there's sort of the exchange where Harry's asking like, are all of your family wizards? Um, and Ron's like, uh, I think so. I think mom's got a second cousin who's an accountant, but we never talk about him. No, 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 no. I don't think that's true. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. So I looked it up and I was like, I want, I'm curious who this second cousin might be. Okay. But so you find? second, so then it's like, no one knows how second cousins are related to you. You, but I know. Se- and this is so I'm just going to read it to you. Second cousins have the same great grandparents as you. So you can think of it this way. Your mom's first cousin's child is your second cousin. Okay. So your mom yeah, or or your grand your grandpa's brother's grandchild, right? So if this is Molly's second cousin, uh-huh. that means it's her grandfather or or just her grandparents brothers grandchild okay right yeah i mean i yes yes well but here's the thing all of the weasleys are pure bloods right so molly's a pure blood meaning that her great grandparent grandparent is a pure blood meaning his brother was a pure blood so his descendants no matter what are not muggles but squibs Squibs, yeah, almost yeah. certainly. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So, yeah. So, no, they're not. I guess that's not even the question, though, is it? Uh, it's, are all your family wizards? So, so I, I guess it's, maybe that's more of it. So, I guess he's a, he's not saying he's a muggle, but. But he I, exists he, within the muggle world. He exists within the muggle world, but would not be, like, um, a full-on. He would at least qualify as squib rather than muggle. Yes, that is. Yeah. yeah, that would would almost certainly have to be the case. And and just to just to back up and, and further clarify, we of course know that Molly comes from the Pruitt line, which is also yeah. uh, pure blood, as well as Arthur's line, which is Weasley, which is also pure blood. So yeah, um, either which way, just to get those those family trees knocked out and and correctly. But I feel like I feel like what I read from that is there's like a like almost like a um, like I don't even know if there's there's some possibility that like this particular member of the Weasley family is sort of like oh yeah he's an accountant we don't we don't really talk about him. We don't, man, <laughs> yeah. don't we don't talk about him. So ba, 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 ba. J- just sort of some of that, like otherwise, like reverse facing, you know, bias, I guess, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> says you must know loads of magic already. Not even a little bit, which is kind of surprising. You'd think Ron would know some magic. Yeah, you definitely you would think so. Um, and and as we like sort of jump forward as well, we get the introduction to Hermione, um, which is which is super fun. Um, here in a, a few different pages or a few pages ahead rather. Um, and th- this is like another one of those moments, and we can jump back around a little bit. But um, Hermione sort of like immediately says like I've practiced a few basic spells already, and it's like like when when yeah when you, like like all I can think is that like once you're on the train, it seems like you might just be allowed to perform magic because there are older. Oh, students. there's no way to yeah do it there. Yeah, and and also the train itself is physically moving, uh, so I feel like your your like geographic location um, is can be kind of specific like, yeah. when, when casting a spell to like figure out where the spell happened I, to me i've always thought that like, she must have done this like before she even got on the train though i know but like, like just she, at home yeah i feel like she's right like that would that would violate i, I guess it would violate underage. it it seems like it might fall into the category of like accidental it, magic. accidental magic or something even though they can clearly tell exact like specific spells are being cast but i wonder if maybe the rule doesn't apply until like you've actually gone to school y- you know the other possibility is just that literally hermione has wizard neighbors Oh, also possible, <laughs> you know, even likely. Right. Yeah. So it's like yeah. it's like, you know, on Privet Drive, it feels pretty clear that with the exception of Mrs. Fig, um, everybody there is distinctly non magical yeah. in all ways. Um, and <laughs> so it feels like maybe it's like it really stands out a year later. Uh, but I suppose it is always entirely possible that like, I mean, a lot of wizards have to live places, you know, it's like yeah. they, they don't <clears throat> all live in, you know, like Hogsmeade, I think, is the only um, fully magical community. 
like in the world, I think. Yeah. yeah so it's or like at least in like Britain. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that means that like, yeah, it wouldn't be entirely uncommon. So maybe that's how she's just getting away with it. And Harry is just really, really in unfortunate circumstances. Yeah. That it's like, no, it's very clearly just you. There's no way around it, Harry. We know you did it. Not some house self numb Dob here. Are you kidding? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> oh, um, man. Also. So uh, next page, yeah, we meet uh, Percy's old rat, which is, of course, Pettigrew, a.k.a. Scabbers. So right away, this is our first introduction to Peter Pettigrew, the rat who's just sitting there. Oh, man, that guy. That guy sucks. I know. It's I, I just I, this is like one of those things, too, like where it would be so interesting to get like a little bit of a backstory as to just like how the Weasleys came to because we know that Ron inherits Scabbers from Percy, but it's like. Why? Where and when did Percy get this this rat from? I know in they the just show place? up like in Percy's room, right? And just be like, "Hey, what's up? I'm your rat now. I'll be here." Like, I suppose I I think at some point we get like an explanation where like Peter needed to be able to like hear wizard news, and so he was like looking for a wizard family to like, you know, yeah, take him in, which like makes sense. But like, I don't know. In general, like you would think that if suddenly you found a rat in the house, you'd try and get rid of it rather than be like it's a pet especially percy percy's like i want to keep this rat as a pet like it just it doesn't feel like it adds up it, it doesn't totally i mean i suppose there's some question as like whether or not like bill and charlie like you never get like a really good feel for how percy feels about bill and charlie and like whether or not like he like looked up to them you all because you almost always see percy as like the oldest the oldest brother he seems like the oldest one because he's the oldest one at school with them right yeah. but like possibly if bill and charlie you both had pets like maybe he'd be like that's very important to me that i have a pet at school and, i guess so um yeah. you know so and it, and it seems like maybe ron has just recently inherited uh scabbers b- basically with percy being you know um receiving that that prefix status and yeah. receiving the owl, oh that's the other so. thing he just gives who gives away their pet <laughs> to, to a sibling <laughs> to a sibling who's gonna be that'd be like and they like a little bit i mean i guess he doesn't know he's gonna be in gryffindor or anything for sure although it seems like you probably can just tell yeah since all of the weasleys have been it's like hey ron you have my rat and then ron will just be at school playing with your pet you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, the whole situation seems weird, um, and it's not the last weird thing that happened with Scabbers on this train ride. Um, but before that, Harry says the word Voldemort out loud, and Ron gasps. Then he says, "I'm not trying to be brave." So once again, Harry's bravery is described, and it's like, yeah, never much of an effort for Harry to be brave. I, but yeah, um, I know. But it, but it is interesting too because I feel like this is such a defining factor of bravery because I highlighted that same exact passage, and it's like bravery. Um, is not the absence of fear bravery is the willingness to act in the face of fear right because it's in what i always say is basically like if you're not afraid of doing something then you're not being brave by doing it because bravery specifically is like a reflection of fear right like it's it's sort of like the counter to that concept right um you know so it's like like while while somebody may fear you know, um, like snakes, for example, like if you handle snakes all the time and you're not afraid of snakes, then you going and handling a snake is not like, oh, wow, you're so it's brave. Not so it's brave. Like, yeah. It's just sort of like I, I just do this like, you know, this is just like, you know, I'm I'm not worried that anything's going to happen. I know my relationship with them well enough. I know the ins and outs well enough. So um, but I feel like that's a little bit of what's happening here is like Harry is like he just doesn't know enough about what's happening in the world to necessarily be terrified of the name. Although knowing that this particular person was the one who, you know, like killed his parents it yeah. would seem like just on reputation alone at this point in time with the knowledge he does have it feels like there's a good possibility that an 11 year old would be pretty, pretty scared of this. and person. it does say later in the chapter that he was starting to get a prickle of fear anytime someone said the name uh, but that was just part of entering the wizarding world he supposed yes yep um as we skew forward a little bit we get the uh the the um the trolley witch. The trolley witch. Yes, indeed. Uh, and Harry is so excited because he finally has some gold and he's going to buy as many Mars bars as he could carry. Boy, it falls right in there with hamburger. It's just a really muggle sounding thing. It does. But like Mars bars, I think are kind of interesting as well because I feel like it must be, a, well, not must be, it, I think it's a muggle British thing. I think so. Like if you went to like the checkout counter at a grocery store, like we have plenty of candy from the Mars candy company. Like I think M&M's are I made think by M&Ms, Mars. M&M's, yeah. Um, but we don't have Mars bars just like on the shelf. Here. I, want, I think are just I think I've looked this up before that Mars bars are just rebranded as Milky Ways in America. OK, that seems I entirely think. reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do remember that uh, when we were kids, our mom and dad went to Ireland to uh, run a marathon 
um, in Dublin. And when they returned, they they brought us back each a Mars bar. I remember it being the best candy bar. It was pretty cool. I feel like it was the best because it was like, oh my gosh, it's so foreign. Uh, but like, you know, like at the same time, not. Um, and actually on this exact same token, this is just an anecdote about my own life, is that my wife Alice is absolutely obsessed with white chocolate crunch bars, which can only be purchased like internationally and they are not available here in the United States. And so like when we first started dating, one of the things I got her for Christmas was like a whole case shipped over. Wow. <laughs> but, it, but it was that's like hilarious. It was such a, like an alarming. It was like a hundred dollars for like 12 white chocolate crunch bars to what? be shipped <laughs> internationally. That's so, hilarious. Yeah. Okay. So here's what it is okay. in the United. So th- there has been like almost intentionally and laughable confusion about this. But the Mars bar was sold as the Milky Way bar in North America. But then back in the UK, they also sold something called a Milky Way, but it's just a different chocolate bar altogether. Wow. Which is extra confusing. Meanwhile, you can also buy in the United States a Mars bar, which is a candy bar with nougat and toasted almonds coated with milk chocolate. So there is a Mars bar and a Milky Way bar in America, which is different from the Mars bar and the Milky Way bar in the UK. Wow. But the Mars bar, the so it starts with the Mars bar in the UK. Then there's the Milky Way bar that is the American name for it. Okay. Then they made a Milky Way bar in the UK, which is different, which is confusing. And then back in America, they also made a Mars bar, which is different from the Mars bar and the Milky Way in the UK. <laughs> So there's just so much confusion. Anyway, um, Milky Ways are good. There we go. Yes, indeed. And (laughs) Harry was not about to buy Mars bars. No. (laughs) Um, In the meantime, though, Ron, of course, has his corned beef sandwiches, um, which are four of them. Four of them. I noticed that. I was like, why so many? Quite a plenty. Quite Um, a plenty. But I will tell you that, like, as I read that, I was like, I know that I'm supposed to be, like, you know, excited for, like, wizard candy and stuff like that. But I was like, I could go for a corned beef sandwich. I know. And he's like, like... he, like he's not like a huge fan of it, which again, this is like one of those things where it's like, like Mrs. Weasley is so kind and thoughtful and considerate and like a great mom and all these things. But it does feel like Ron just very consistently gets like the short mm-hmm. end of the stick in right. a way that like, like, you know, even even when you when you hear about like the Yule Ball in year four, like it doesn't seem like Fred and George where like. Secondhand dress robes. Secondhand dress robe. Like they're not embarrassed to wear like whatever it is that they've got. But like Ron is is you know laden with like the the lacy. Even Jenny must have okay ones. Right. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like so, maybe she didn't need hers until later or something. But like still, like Ron is the one who definitely gets the short end of the stick. He gets the the color sweater he doesn't like. He later gets socks that don't go well with his clothing. It's I know, like it, he gets it, these sandwiches. But it's like he's also a little defensive about it. He says she hasn't got much time, which is like I feel like that sentence doesn't really like like line up with magic in general because like you can just make the sandwiches with magic and you can duplicate the sandwiches with magic so it's like the time is not much of an excuse for your crummy sandwiches (laughs) i I don't think uh, yeah you know it's a really strange one too because that's the other thing too is that like this is really the only time that anything that mrs weasley makes is ever regarded as less than oh i know yeah it's like Like, yeah like why aren't they good sand it's like they're dry and it's like that doesn't sound like a mrs all of mrs weasley's food is amazing all the time except for these sandwiches it's a specific plot point in deathly hallows that like ron is struggling with camping specifically because he used to square meals either from the hogwarts house elves or from his mom's yeah. like, spectacular cooking. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, yeah, it's like one of those. I, I mean, it's like the platform nine and three quarters thing. I mean, we're, we've spent way too much time talking about it for how important it is to the plot. But it is it is always just like one of those things where it's like, oh, all right then. Um, let's see. So then, uh, what the the next moment though, I really do like a lot. This is Harry's ability um, because he has never had anything to share before, or indeed anyone to share it with. Yes. This this is like both a sad and happy moment because it's like it's so neat to see that like the moment that Harry has anything to share his first instinct is to do so yeah like it's like you you could see a situation where it's like it's like I, i'm sorry but like my whole life i've never been able to buy candy and i just i can and i just really want to be able to enjoy it all. i just want like, to try it all like i mean it wouldn't match harry's character in any way but like for an 11 year old to have that take or that perspective on it like not unheard of not unheard of yeah, yeah. so i love this i i love that like you know the the first thing that that harry really does is like an act of generosity and um a way to to bond with with ron 
Yes, I love that as well. Um, and in doing that, they start opening the chocolate frog cards. Uh, Ron says he's missing Agrippa, which this is one of those things. Whenever you re- whenever you're listening to it, it sounds like he's missing a Agrippa card, yes. but it's not. He's missing an Agrippa card. And I looked it up because I was like, we don't get much more content. So I can just tell you for fun fact who Agrippa is in the wizarding world. He lived from 19, eight, from 1486 to 1535. He wrote books about magic and wizards. Some important people thought his books were evil, so they put him in jail for writing them. That's what it says on his chocolate frog card. Wow. Fun okay. fact. Okay. Yes. So interesting little piece of information. Yeah. 100%. I always thought that this was like a, like a strange occasion where a Agrippa was a fantastic beast of some kind, and it was sort of like um it, it was it was almost as if like this was less of a specific person and more of like a like a, well, just a, like generic, a species like a species yeah, yeah it's yeah. like, like I, I need I'm like missing the, a dummy guys card exactly yes yeah. yes precisely yeah um the other one he's missing is the tall me card yep. and this is sort of like a funny thing because similar to nicholas flamel who will come up in a second tall me was just a real person in real like you know history um so it's just sort of funny that like the book like the wizard like as you're reading it you realize like oh these famous people from what you think the, what you think of as famous people from muggle history maybe they're actually famous because they were wizards yes or whatever. Um, but hilariously, what Ptolemy is uh, famous for is he's a second century Greek mathematician, astronomer, and geographer who is famous for his controversial and wrong opinion of a geocentric theory of the universe, which is the idea that the Earth is the center of the universe. Ah. So that is what Ptolemy is famous for. So it's funny that he's just um, famously wrong about it. That is very famous. <laughs> that, yeah, oh, no, that is very interesting. Um, and I'm glad you looked into it because I was like, I was like, I, these certainly are people. Um, yeah. Then we get Albus Dumbledore. One of the things I was just really curious about is uh, underneath it, it says currently headmaster of Hogwarts. Yep. Um, I am so fascinated to know whether or not the chocolate frog card might update like itself. I know. I look, I literally highlighted the word currently because yes. I was like, I wonder if he stopped being it, would it change it? Because if that's the case or like if he does other accolades, like how do they go about choosing which accolades go on there? Or is it just sort of like the fraud, the cards ability to be like, now, this is what this person is known for. I'll adjust my information accordingly. It would be especially funny as time went on because I feel like when Dumbledore is is under the scrutiny of the, um, like he like loses his order of Merlin and, you know, he's yes. like, like taken away from um, like all the other councils and everything. But like, I, I think Bill or, or Fred or George or someone jokingly says like, the only thing he cares about is that they keep him on the chocolate frog cards. And it would be so funny if... Um, like, like at that point in time, all the other accolades were like removed and it just said like Albus Dumbledore on a chocolate frog card. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so funny. I also love his description on the chocolate frog card. It just says particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945. Next, like what a simplification of that whole event since yep. there was apparently going to be five full movies about it. Uh, I thought it was funny. Then, they, of course, this is when they name drop uh, Nicholas Flamel for the first time, which is like, oh, if you're paying attention, there it is. Um, and then it ends with uh, chamber music and 10 pin bowling, which is just super funny. That That's one of the things. I like to think Dumbledore, like, insisted, like, wrote his own chocolate frog card or something. Oh, I know. Yeah. I, I, I don't even know what chamber music is. I think, like, I, I, I've always thought it's just, like, church music or something. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, now I that would, you say it, I'm like, hmm. Yeah, like for some reason, I always associate it, and, and I have no explanation for this with the toilet, with like the, like just like, like a like, chamber pot, like, you know? like elevator like, music, but in a bathroom. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. Exactly that. Oh man, um, hold on. Let's see. Hold on. I'm gonna look up chamber music. Chamber music da, 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 is a form of classical music that is composed for a small for a small group of instruments. Traditionally, a group that could fit in a palace or chamber or a large room. Okay. All right. There you go. Chamber music. So chamber music. How about yeah. that? Um, the other fun fact about uh, or chocolate frog cards, and not even really a fact, but more of a theory, is that the reason that it was so important for Dumbledore to be on the chocolate frog cards is that it was like an early iteration of what Hermione will eventually do for Dumbledore's army with the um, the protean charm galleons yes. as a, a means for communicating. And this is like one of those like really interesting things where uh, in like Crimes of Grindelwald, we know that there's like a big book that. The the uh, the members of whatever this pre order of the phoenix happened to be are able to like open to like portraits of one another and communicate like 
trans globally. Yeah. You know, like it's it's a very powerful piece of magic. And so the idea is almost like you'd be very curious if like Dumbledore quite literally had the ability to um, communicate through the chocolate frog cards with anybody who like potentially had one. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, and it, there's like a bunch of references to it because like even even the very next line, it says like, you know, Harry looked back and saw to his astonishment that Dumbledore's face had disappeared. And Ron's like, well, you can't expect him to hang around all day. But I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like, that's not how portraits work. Like, Dumbledore is not physically there. Like, it, like, he can move around, but typically there really is no reason the, the portrait should just leave altogether. Right. You know, right, so like, yep. there's that. And then, like, even earlier, we just said, like, Dumbledore's like, the only thing he cares about is that they don't take him off the chocolate frog cards. And it's like, Yes, because that is literally his method of communication. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Yep. It's a, and, but, and it would also feel like, you know, uh, I think that eventually in King's Cross Station, when when Dumbledore is talking to Harry, he's like, you know, Voldemort doesn't understand things like this, like house elves and children's tales. And I, I feel like this is even like one of those things where like, like Voldemort could have easily foiled lots of Dumbledore's plans by just paying attention to these tra- these collectible trading cards. Right. Even the fact that Dumbledore uses candy as his um, passwords mm-hmm. for for you yeah. know, the Gryffindor, right. as it were, as it were, you know, which is which is sort of the inspiration for for the podcast name. Um, <laughs> it's like it just suggests that like you know this is like one of the, like Dumbledore is like aware of the fact he's like everybody underestimates candy. Like, right. Like candy is a very powerful thing because it brings joy to people and that joy is like you know it's like reflected in like what what it means otherwise. So anyway, I, I I've always loved that thought like i think it's just so fascinating and interesting um that especially because eventually what hermione does for dumbledore's army is effectively a rudimentary version of this exact same concept so yeah like little little like one-way walkie-talkies um so pretty cool pretty cool um the uh birdie bots every flavored beans uh i think is is pretty fun you get like you know you get the order ordinary flavors like chocolate and peppermint and marmalade and i was like I like this assortment. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> okay. Sure. Those when I think of generic, uh, like like flavored beans, you know, like Jelly Bellies or something. Yeah. Uh, marmalade, peppermint, both on that list. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Yeah. I mean, well, the thing is so funny that the way you phrase that because like if you think of like Jelly Bellies, like jelly is just sort of like marmalade is just a different kind of jelly. That's an extremely good point. <laughs> yeah. That I hadn't I hadn't considered it at all. So, um, I'm I'm sort of. Uh, frustrated with this very next passage though because um, Ron does bite into one of the beans and we did ju- we did just have a, a Jay versus Ben yeah. uh, trivia question that was specifically what was the flavor of the first bean that that Ron bites into yeah. and I think I put turnips yeah and, and it the, sprouts it sprouts mm-hmm. and I was like oh my gosh I was so, I was mm-hmm. in the zip code you were right there you were right there but guess what this is also where Harry is brave enough to nibble off the edge of a green one, or a gray one hey there you go yep See? yep you're Harry's right Harry's bravery comes up again I know I know mm-hmm. that's amazing mm-hmm. okay so big emphasis on that um let's see then the, once again we have the return of um <laughs> <laughs> or the escape of the, the escape of Trevor the Toad, uh, which we, we've already sort of covered a little bit. Uh, Ron pulls out his wand. You got like a little bit of unicorn hair poking out uh, the failed spell. Um, all of these types of things are, are happening. Um, Hermione's uh, introduction proper, I think, is pretty cool because she sort of like knows about Harry, despite the fact that she, too, has been isolated from um, the wizarding, the wizarding world. world. So yeah. I think it goes to speak to Harry's fame even more like this is like you know every every um like wizarding household would of course know harry's name but this is somebody who didn't come from there uh who who still has been able to find uh you know books and and information about you know harry himself which i I found pretty cool and each of those texts you know you could easily make a question which is just which of these um is not one of the books that hermione references that she had seen harry in which is modern magical history the rise and fall of the dark arts and great wizarding events in the 20th century i think what's interesting about that is that you can almost assume from the context from the rest of the book is that um, Nicholas Flamel plays no part in any of these things like so specifically like no part in any great great wizarding events of the 20th century or in the rise and fall of the dark arts which I you would assume is like a book about Voldemort I guess but like given um, it seems like it would also be about Grindelwald if it's you know a fairly recent book yeah and since like 
you know, Nicholas Flamel like is in the Fantastic Beast movies. Like clearly he's not like ever fighting Grindelwald directly, but he must not be involved enough to warrant a mention because later on she can't remember him at all. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. So that's if he point. was if he was a part of it, he would have been mentioned in these books. So we can just sort of um, abstract that bit of information from there as well. That is true. Uh, we also get a line here from Hermione who says that, um, I hope I'm in Gryffindor. It sounds by far the best. I hear Dumbledore, Dumbledore himself was in it, but I suppose Ravenclaw wouldn't be too bad. I, I'm like, there's no way in the world. I mean, maybe there is because obviously Hermione ends up being a fantastic Gryffindor, but like it seems she's even a hat stall. Yeah. Like, you know, it seems like, like she would clearly recognize like, like that this would be a potentially good house for her oh yeah well I, what i think what i thought about what i highlighted that she says i hope i'm in gryffindor it sounds by far the best so my thought was like did she choose gryffindor too like was the hat like hmm, ravenclaw seems like a pretty good fit and she's like you know but i want to be in gryffindor or whatever and it's like you know it's our choices that define us or whatever i could see that i mean because you know? she is i believe you know what is it like five minutes that the, it would take for the hat to decide to yeah if it takes more than five minutes to decide it's a hat stall okay yeah so i feel like that that would would suggest that at that point in time the hat basically is like putting it in your hands yeah more so basically mm-hmm. saying like well you know like you could be in either of these and i think you would excel in both of them right what, what do you think Mm-hmm. You know, because because like, then I think it would it would reflect even more. Yeah, I um, like that idea that, that she chooses Gryffindor the same as Harry. Yes. Yep. Of course. Um, let's see here. We learn a little bit about the other professions in the wizarding world. Um, oh, yeah. as, as Ron starts talking about his two oldest brothers, Charlie and Bill. Charlie's in Romania studying dragons and Bill's in Africa doing something for Gringotts. Um, this has always felt like one of these things where like the the ecosystem of um, professions in the wizarding world seems rather like finite in nature. Like, yeah. Like there's, you know, it, it seems like you could become like a professor a shop owner, like work for the government, work for the government. Yeah. You know, like, or, or like kind of, kind of what else? Um, and so it's, yeah. it's kind of fascinating that, I mean, Quidditch you know, player, Quidditch player, mm-hmm. yeah, potential profession. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's not that many different like pathways for, for all these people to go. And realistically, when it comes down to it, I think what we've always kind of said is that like in Harry's year, if there's five boys, let's just assume that there are also five girls four uh, houses means 40 new students per year. And this is all rough numbers, but then seven years of, of students at school at once means 280, you know, students across this entire age range, at least in like Britain. Yeah. Um, it's like the wizarding population, at least in this particular area is, is not huge. Yeah. Like, it's like, there's like up, you know, as many as 40 new people joining the workforce per year right which is pretty small now i have heard arguments before that like the re- like perhaps hogwarts population is particularly small while, while hair is, is there because of the first wizarding war so lots of like parent potential parents would have died in the war yeah yielding well, a smaller crop of students for this generation that totally makes sense yeah. I, I feel like that definitely tracks and it does feel like the type of thing where um I suspect the school would would almost be a bit of its own room of requirement, if you will, where it's like it will always be able to perfectly house however many students are there. Yeah. Like without issue. I think that's probably true, too. It'll it'll just sort of expand as needed. I think there's an Um, interesting line in here, though. They're, They're talking about Gryffindor and Slytherin and stuff like that. And Harry says, that's the house vault. I mean, you know who was in. And Ron's like, yeah. Or Ron confirms, yeah, that he's like he's aware of that. But what is interesting to me is that, like, it seems to be fairly well known that Voldemort was in Slytherin, but not very well known that Tom Riddle is Voldemort. You know, because, like, even the next year, Ron is polishing the trophy for special services to the school, which is Tom Riddle on it. And it's not like he's like, oh, God, I know who this is, even though he knows Voldemort was in Slytherin. So it seems like people just sort of know he was there, but no one seems to be able to piece together like the connective tissue that Tom Riddle is Voldemort. Like I, who do they think he was then? Well, I know. And this is a good point. I mean, you and I have just recently spent a little bit of time sort of like delving into those first years after um, Tom Riddle graduates 
uh, which I, I always struggle to remember how, what year he's in, in Chamber of Secrets, uh, when, when Hagrid basically is accused of opening the chamber. Uh, I think he's um, a fifth year. He's a fifth year. Okay. Yeah. So, um, anyway, so like that, that roughly speaking means that Tom Riddle would graduate in the mid 1940s. Um, and we know that he goes on to work for Borgen and Burks, which is when like all the, uh, Hepzibah Smith stuff and everything happens. Um, this is like during a period of time where like he would have basically been exiting the school with, with similar accolades to Dumbledore himself. Like, I mean, yeah, he's like, like one of the most talented most brilliant students. students ever. Yeah, yeah. Like, like highly talented. It's like everybody loves him. You know, like it seems like, you know, like Slughorn would have put him in touch with anybody and yet he goes to work for, for Borgen and Burks. Mm-hmm. For the longest time, you and I both have operated under the assumption that he was only at Borgen and Burks for about like a year or so, like a pretty brief spell. Yeah, but um, we mapped it out pretty hard um, a couple weeks ago and it turns out it was like there's like it's it's like a minimum of 10 years that he's working there. Yeah, but so I almost think a huge portion of this could be like Voldemort like who whose goal is to be immortal 10 years is effectively nothing to him. Like that that doesn't really matter in the yeah. scheme of things. Like he you know, it, it seems like too much of a um a compliment to say like oh he was patient you know like he was willing to like wait you know for for whatever but like i think that maybe on some level um like he desperately i mean even the fact that he changes his name from tom riddle to voldemort wants to disassociate from that name from that identity from from any knowledge that he was that boy so the the fact that he may have spent such a huge amount of time in part literally could have just been like let people forget I, I was ever there so that when I return, I will not be the the shadow. Oh, of Tom yeah. Riddle. Like it's part of his part of his plan to be forgotten as it, Tom Riddle. Yeah. Which makes sense because we've always sort of felt like there's this era of, of Voldemort's existence that just like it's like, why was he not doing anything? Yeah. Why does it take so if he graduates in the 1940s, why does he like like how long is the war going on? The first wizarding war. Right. Yeah. You know, like what? You know, in in what nineteen eighty, he still hasn't won yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and (laughs) you know, and apparently is the the I mean, dwarf. I mean, makes makes Grindelwald pale in comparison. And Grindelwald had a pretty massive following. So, um, anyway, it's 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 hard to know exactly how all of that you know sort of shakes out. But you but you are. I mean, I think you make a great point where it's like everybody seems to know Voldemort was in Slytherin, but like how? Yeah. Like Like, yeah. like, Like then why can't? But yeah, no one's realized like what what records did he said? What was he like as a student? It's like, yeah, like, yeah. Like people must have, yeah, you're exactly right. That's a good, that is a really good question. I feel like I don't even know if I fully processed it when you first brought it up, but that's, yeah, it's, it's like he must have done something. It must have done something. That hard. Maybe that, maybe there just had to be more students back at that period of time where it would have been like way harder to, to dissect out who it would have been. Because if you were like, roughly speaking, he must've been a student sometime in the past 20 years right. we can pretty much narrow that down to approximately like this many total people hard stop like yeah it wouldn't even seem that hard to deduce out who his identity was but i don't know yeah i, guess, I mean i guess it doesn't matter even to figure it out it's just sort of like surprising that people know he went to hogwarts and what house he was in but not who he was yes yeah um there is a funny exchange down here where they're talking about uh gringotts having been broken into and uh, Ron says his dad says it must have been a powerful dark wizard to get around Gringotts. And I just made a note like or three teenagers uh, <laughs> <laughs> because we know three teenagers can because get in there. they do it. To be fair, they do use an unforgivable curse to get in. So and a deathly hallow and a Gringotts goblin. Yeah. So, so they have a lot. And they're not just waltzing around. They're almost immediately caught. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it almost doesn't work. Yeah. Like really badly. <laughs> But it does. Uh, but I also like our, where Rod's like, of course, everyone's scared when something like this happens in case you know who's behind it. It's like, and he is. Yeah, Hunter, right, yeah. <laughs> Rod, <laughs> right on top of it. <laughs> Nail on the head, old yep. boy. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. And then we have the uh, the intro to Malfoy, who yes. once again has come back. This is where we, we mentioned, I think, in the last chapter. But uh, at this point in time, the, uh, the former Death Eaters, you know, who had sort of gone into hiding after the fall of the Dark Lord or Voldemort, you know, on um, when he attacked Harry as a, as a baby, uh, there were plenty of people, including the Malfoys, who believed that there was a decent possibility that Harry himself could be the second coming of the Dark Lord. So Malfoy's um, extension of a hand in friendship here is probably not him being friendly or even open to being friends with Harry for the right reasons, but probably much, much, much more because of the guidance from his his family. Um, is what is the way I read? Yeah, that. yeah, like. Well, 
Yeah. What I think is interesting here is that like Malfoy comes down and he sort of opens the compartment and he says, is it true? They're saying down the train, Harry Potter's in this compartment. So it's you, is it? So it's like, that's him seeing Harry and being like, it must be you, you're Harry Potter. But then later on the next page, he said, um, I'd be careful if I were you, Potter, unless you're a bit politer, you go the same way as your parents. They didn't know what was good for them either. You hang around with riffraff like the Weasleys and Hagrid, and it'll rub off on you, which is interesting to me because he references Hagrid here, meaning that since he has come into the compartment, he has remembered that it was Harry who he was talking to and Madame Malkins. Oh, because like yeah. otherwise he'd have no D- data point for Hagrid. For Hagrid, you're, yeah, that, that's true. That's true. So he's like, he, he's talking to him. He's like, wait, a he's second. like, I have already stepped in it with this kid, but I, <laughs> I have met you already. Oh man, oh. I had the chance. I, I blew it. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, we we do have a, a kind of unexpected situation that comes in this wake, though. So this obviously yes, kind of starts a little we bit of do. a fight. Um, Crab or Goyle, Goyle ends up reaching towards the the chocolate frogs to sort of just like bully them away from Ron. Um, and of of all characters, it is Scabbers who's the hero of the scene, uh, who basically chomps right into Goyle's hand and then gets like thrown against the window. Uh, this this instance makes no sense to me. The, like I don't even I don't get it at all. The only thing I can think here is that at this at this moment you have a young Peter Pettigrew who does not know that the Dark Lord could be back and is literally facing down one of his best friend's sons who have in in his family, um, like, uh, unless you're a bit politer, you'll go the same way as your parents. Like, from Peter's perspective, I mean, he's no hero. I'm not here to defend Peter Pettigrew at all. But, like, this could have, uh, like, raised Peter's hackles a little bit. Um, Like, essentially Peter being like, like, you know, I was I turned on the Potters out of fear, not out of like lack of not because I didn't like James Potter, not mm. because I even like followed the Dark Lord's regime. I mean, Peter is a coward. Yeah, is, is what it really comes down to. So the fact that he acts in this situation at all is surprising. But I would say my explanation is just literally that Malfoy has just insulted James and Lily in front of who was one of their best friends. But it's his fault they're dead. It absolutely is. I, I, it barely makes sense. Yeah. I, I'm giving the best argument. I know. I'm like, I don't get why he does this at just at all. Other than, yeah, you're right. Everything he does is cowardly, except even then attacking someone seems like a little more brave than I'd give him credit for. It's really his peak moment as a character. It, this is basically it. Yeah. Even like the the sparing of Harry's life, that's like a, you know, the, even that, it's, it's barely a sparing. It's like a, it's a more moment of hesitance. It is, yeah, you know, it which is, just yeah. turns on him immediately. But, um, but yeah. yeah so yeah. anyway, it's a, weird, it's a weird scene. But then he promptly goes back to sleep. So yeah. I, that's the other thing too. Is I'm like, gosh, I, if I was in animagus form all the time, I can't, I would be so bored. I know. I would be so bored. I would just, I, you know, especially like I, at the very least. May, on the flip side, maybe I wouldn't be bored. Maybe I would use my my animal like abilities to go and do fun things. But like all he seems to do is sleep all the time. Yeah. Which just sounds miserable. Hmm. Um. Anyway, so uh, as we as we scoot forward, though, we do finally make it to Hogwarts. We're we're in our robes. Yeah, um, we do. We have found our way uh, to basically Hagrid, who's calling for all the first years. Of course, Hagrid spots Harry immediately, which is always just kind of great. Like I feel like there's there's so much comfort. Um, I, I actually felt this way, like going to, um, my own college orientation, like you go to orientation and you really don't know anybody, but then you meet like the 10 people at orientation. So like when you go back mm-hmm. a month later and it's like, Hey, you from orientation, it's like, I you, remember you, I know a person and you are that person. And we are now friends. Want to go get lunch, please? Yeah. Because I need someone to make me feel like I'm at home. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. I can relate to sort of like Harry getting there. He's in like a brand new space. He's never like they're in the, the it's dark, you know, it's like they're in the, the depths of Scotland and the mountains and the lake and everything. And there's a, there's a friendly face. So I love that for him. Um, I do. I do love the um, we, we talked a little bit about like, is there a reason why the first years take the boats while everybody else takes uh, the threshold drawn carriages up to the castle? And I felt like you had a good a good point here, which is essentially like to 
provide the rest of the students the opportunity to get into the great hall so that they can already be there. Yeah. And then the first years can sort of like get their first glimpse of the castle from the boats, which is no doubt just gorgeous. Um, and then also can sort of like enter the school with, with the rest of the students sort of like waiting for the sorting ceremony to then begin to begin. That's yep. right. Yeah. Um, I do. There, it, as we're getting to the school, we go under the tunnel. Um, this is where Neville loses Trevor again and they're getting out of the boats and Haggard calls out like, Oh, you there? Is this your toad? That was a, such a bad Haggard. Sorry. Um, and Neville turns around and goes, Trevor! And he's like, it's as if Neville's found him here. It's not like, oh, yeah, right, I forgot him. It's like, I found him, which to me sounds like somehow Trevor got in the boat with him. Like, he keeps trying to escape, but then did follow Neville into the boat, which is also weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't I don't get it. Um, also means as the way he reacts, it sounds like Neville was just like, I guess I just lost him. Oh, well, time to get on the boats. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, it i know i know it's, it, it's so miserable to think that you would have like your brand new pet coming to school with you and like it's just like I, like could you could you even imagine like not even making it into the threshold of the castle and having just lost the new pet entirely oh i know not only that i mean like one like i mean what is it one sentence later hagrid immediately is like you still got your toad <laughs> <laughs> just like it's like <laughs> no, not even one. And I love that Hagrid immediately is able to. He says, "Oh, you there? Is this your toad?" Like he <laughs> picks up. Like I'm imagining Hagrid sees the toad, <laughs> looks around. That kid brought the toad. <laughs> Him. I, I, I know who brought the toad. I, yeah, especially because Hagrid's the one who told us that, that toads went out of style years yeah. ago. <laughs> He's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've sorted this. That one. I will say the, the amount that Neville loses his toad in this chapter, I feel like if I hadn't ever put chapter six under such a specific spotlight as we're doing for this podcast, I don't know that it's ever really stood out to me, but I got to the end of this chapter and I was like, I'm really tired of Trevor being lost. Yeah. Like I was like, it is. you are really, really beat over the head with it um and and i, I just, it's like all i can think is that like what we're going for here is like we got, okay, got to make sure that remember all makes sense and i'm like i don't even think you really do i think it would have been fine it's fine yeah like i don't know that it, we get like, it it gives me anxiety to think the number of times that this toad is lost i'm like yeah. there's how is he ever gonna get like through the sorting ceremony like where does the toad go where does trevor go for the sorting? i know he's still holding his yeah the, <laughs> he just walks up there <laughs> hands it to mcgonagall <laughs> yeah, I, Hold I, this. I, I could see McGonagall just being like, like please not don't Gryffindor. Please, don't be please Gryffindor. not Gryffindor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gryffindor, man. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Neville's also a hat stall, so it would have been five minutes of McGonagall having to hold the toad. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think he's not quite, he's just shy of the hat stall. Oh, is he? That, yeah, the, the, I think I was reading that last week because Neville, um, Neville is, in, well, we're about to get to it anyway, but Neville's insisting for Hufflepuff. Yeah. And the hat just does not listen. He's just like, N- uh, dude. I see what's inside fun. you. I yep, see. You I know better than you, my man. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, so that brings us to the end of our discussion of chapter six, where now we, of course, need to uh, discuss our chapter art. Our chapter art. We it, get a little a little image here of uh, of a of a just really big looking chocolate frog. Yeah. And, and a photo of a really happy looking, um, almost Santa Claus esque Albus Dumbledore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I will say that I don't mind the artwork that much, but one of my most disappointing uh, sensations with like the wizarding world as it has been manufactured into like merch and such like that is that the chocolate frogs are just chronically disappointing. Oh, Um, they are terrible. Yeah. Like they are. I mean, one, they are massive. Yes. They are very big if you buy them. So maybe to scale, this is correct. Um, Although they have hexagon shapes now, so this card is actually well, maybe this is the more canon version of the card that it's a rectangle, like a regular trading card, more of like a playing card. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in real, in in actual real life, if you go to Universal or buy a chocolate card, it'll be that like um, hexagon shape. Yep. But yeah, gosh, the car, and we, me and you did a video once where we tasted uh, every single kind of candy available at Honeydukes in Universal, and it was just like across the board, whatever chocolate they're using, it's just not very high quality. It's not, yeah. yeah. It's it's like a waxy kind of like I don't know. It's it, it's really it's just not it's just not super great. So it's, it's like, not great. Not only is it like not very good chocolate, but like eating a brick of chocolate is just like it's it's like a. Um, 
it's like a a non-consumable amount of candy and even just like biting it like it's not like it's not hollow it's it's such a brick so anyway what i've always wanted so universal or whoever if you're listening um is like uh like i almost feel like if it was filled with like caramel and nuts or something like i i I don't know if that would be like off-putting for it to be frog shaped and like filled with like something like (laughs) Um, you need to be able to put the entire chocolate frog in your mouth at once as described in the books as described so maybe what you really need to do now uh, the thing i would say is that the packaging that it comes in is beautiful yeah like you can keep the packaging exactly as that's almost the reason to buy it though yeah but like you know like chocolate turtles is kind of what i'm thinking of yeah like normally and maybe that's even like the inspiration for a chocolate frog i don't even know but like the um like a chocolate turtle is like a like a like nuts caramel chocolate you know, so p- just pack like three or four of those inside of the exact same box, make them like delicious and tasty instead of this very like otherwise unusable brick of. I mean, hot it chocolate. is. It is. Yeah. Because ever uh, all the chocolate there is like the same chocolate, but at least some of the other chocolate has like fun, whimsical wizard things like mixed in. Yeah. To like, so it's not all chocolate, but this is like, it is. the. What's frustrating is that it's the most famous candy in the store yeah and also the worst one there and it's just not good it's yeah. just not good and it's like it should be because it's expensive it's the one you want it's like when you go in you're like i want to try a butterbeer and i want to get a chocolate frog and it's like don't get the chocolate frog it's not good they yeah. don't then yeah i mean if you want it for the sake of display that's for one thing if you want the card that's great but yeah i wish the candy itself tasted better it would it would almost be better if it was like a bar of soap <laughs> a, a brown bar of soap. Just a brown bar of soap. Yeah. You know? It'd be more useful at least. Chocolate soap. Chocolate soap. So anyway, I do like the artwork on this one. It is fun. I like when they're a- eating the chocolate frogs. And obviously, it's cool that they put the chocolate frog, uh, the Dumbledore card on there because it's such a, it feels like a little just like MacGuffin when Harry gets it. And it's like, oh, Dumbledore. <laughs> but it's like, no, that was important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's a big um, clue. How about a review? Do you have a review for us? I do. I have a review for us of the the podcast. Um, this is from Hetty Ruth, who says, Spectacular! Sensational podcast hosts Ben and Jay Carlin combine their history of conversational expertise, see popcorn culture, with their vast knowledge of Harry Potter and this incredible new show. These brothers have the charisma and magnetism of professional entertainers, the true sons of a news anchor, which never fails to leave listeners enthralled. Their camaraderie leads to wonderful banter and extremely captivating discussions surrounding one of their favorite book series. This show is absolutely worth the listen. In. My goodness. Thank you, Hetty Ruth. <laughs> wow. What a remarkably what a well flattering review. That is so. Th- I'm thank- like, I don't even know if you're right about this. I, yeah. I, I know. I know. It's like, I, I can never live up to what you just said. Yeah, no. but, but thank you so very much. Thank and, you. Um, as ever, it's been really cool to see uh, the Through the Gryffindor on some of like the, the Spotify charts. I think we got as high as 67. 67. Well, on Spotify, when I looked today, we were at 114. So we're still on there. We're still on there. We're still, we're on still the charts, on there. Yeah, and so. of course, in Sweden, and we're just crushing it in Sweden. Yeah, absolutely. What up, Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> we need shirts that say like "I'm big in Sweden." I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so no, it's been really cool. So any any feedback you guys have for the show, if you'd be happy to leave a review, we would absolutely appreciate it, and maybe even read it here in one of the episodes. Uh, so definitely check that out. But otherwise, guys, um, I think that's all for this week. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll see you next time through the Gryffindor.